Experience Week. What are Experience Weeks all about and why are we making this very considerable commitment uh, in terms of effort uh, and people power and, and, uh, and connections? Uh, and it really has to do, in my mind, with what Montessori is all about. You know, we made a very conscious decision uh, a couple years back when right. we uh, did our rebranding <laughs> that the thing that differentiates us from every other elementary program on the North Shore is Montessori. Uh, and that, uh, and that to, uh, uh, Jen Dickman is fond of talking about uh, red oceans and blue oceans. Uh, a red ocean is where every fishing boat is fishing for the same fish in the same spot. Place. <laughs> uh, and that's sort of what happens in the independent or private school world on the North Shore or in any market like this. Everybody's fishing for the same kids in the same spot. Uh, and, 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 you know, gets to be a problem. Uh, but if you create your own blue ocean, if you say, wait a minute, we are different. And this is our difference. And we didn't have to go look for something to be different because Montessori, uh, that's what we are. And so if you look at what Montessori is all about, it's about engagement, it's about, it's about hands-on learning, uh, it's about kids getting into following passions and getting into things and, and really understanding and learning them. It's interdisciplinary. Uh, and, and so we thought, particularly in a world where uh, Jim and I were talking about this just a minute ago, that uh, you know, a few years ago we were sort of, okay, you, your child was here for the academic day, and, then maybe you're here for A block, and maybe you're here for B and C block, and then maybe you get vacation coverage for a week, and you know, whatever. And more and more and more, we are serving your children and you all day, every day, all year. Uh, it's the way the world is. And so why shouldn't everything we do reflect that? Uh, and so we saw an opportunity. Uh, we saw an opportunity to create a, a, a part, a serious part of our curriculum that allowed kids to focus, uh, to take, take a step back from going from this mat to that mat to this activity to, to, you know, to language, and to, to take a block of time and really focus in on, on an area, on uh, something, and learn what it was like, what it meant to, to dive deep and to work hard at something on a sustained period of time. And to also, in that process, to really build some, some critical skills. So one of the common themes in, in all these experience weeks is observation. Is learning to see what you do, learning to see what's in front of you. And connection and, and complexity, and understanding how the dots are connected. So for example, uh, one of the programs is, one of the programs is, is, is up at uh, Maritime Gloucester in, the, in February, which is for Lower elementary kids, uh, we'll have them in their uh, in the in the Maritime Gloucester uh, pocket aquarium and their wet lab and the ice house where they do work. really getting their hands wet, <laughs> literally, uh, with marine with marine life and marine marine uh, environment uh, and observing and to make sure that they are observing. One of the teachers from here who's going to be with them is uh, Elise Katoga is our new art teacher. So why is an art teacher going to a science lab? Because at the end of the day, if we're observing, they have to do something with that observation. They have to be able to take that observation and create something with it. Uh, and so the, the connection, I mean, this is an idea that's as old as Alexander von Humboldt and the, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the origins of modern science. Uh, you know, the idea of observation and representation and interpretation. Uh, these are basic skills uh, which we think we can really cement in some interesting ways. Uh, I know that Diana Dorn is going to be talking about one of the programs that she's, uh, she's working on, uh, which will connect uh, geometry and mathematics with art and with the staff of the Addison Gall Gallery at Andover, uh, at Phillips Andover. Uh, and the idea that art and, and mathematics are inexorably linked. You really cannot understand and appreciate art or create art without understanding mathematics. Uh, and so, uh, so there's really this really cool stuff. Uh, but the purpose of it isn't to be cool. It really is to to challenge your students, 
Uh, every one of these programs is solidly academic in nature, even though some of them sound like they're fun. And so I would like you not to share that secret with your kids. <laughs> yeah, they think, wow, this is going to be fun. We're going to go make maple syrup. Uh, but then, <laughs> uh, they don't, you know, we're sneaking in the stuff that they're actually going to learn. Uh, and, uh, and so it's a little bit of a sugar coating or syrup coating package, I guess. Uh, but uh, every one of these, uh, every, every child is going to be held accountable for the work they do. Uh, you will see uh, you will see this on their progress reports, uh, and, uh, and so this is this is good, I think. Uh, logistics: uh, we are we've had the catalog up online. You haven't been able to apply yet because we've been working out some details of how many kids can we take in each class and where which weeks do we need the bus for that and this and all of that. But that's just about worked out. Uh, I think Sarah and Rachel have been getting that down to the short strokes and I would expect within the next day or two we'll be online and you'll be able to apply. Uh, we're opening this to students outside of our school. Uh, so, uh, for, you know, so that there are the, the weeks the, the program align with the weeks of either the public school or private school vacations, uh, but our own families have priority. So it's a, it's a space of uh, offer to, to kids from outside of our school. And so if you're telling a friend about this and they want to apply, they can go on and make an inquiry and uh, we will just tell them when, when there's a slot open. We're going to put a deadline for our own families of November 1st. Uh, basically, if you haven't signed up for it by November 1st, uh, then it's first come first serve with the whole rest of the world. So uh, I think by November 1, you might you might sort of know what you're doing for the year, uh, hopefully. But, uh, uh, two of the experience weeks are included in your tuition. Uh, the rest are a la carte. The only one that has a any major additional cost uh, is the presidential traverse which is a middle school uh, thing and uh, that's because the Appalachian Mountain Club charges us a pretty hefty fee for lodgings and guides and, and all of that. Everything else is is, is included. All the other uh, weeks are, are, are included uh, in, in the base cost. Uh, I'll be happy to answer other questions later. Or really? Later. But I'd like to just, and we, again, we don't have everyone here who's offering, uh, but I'd like to just give you, let them give you a sort of sample of uh, what, uh, what we're doing. So why don't we start down at the end with this? Uh... <laughs> um, so the plan that I have is for the this two weeks in June that are post school, and Heather and I will be doing the first week after school. Um, mapping so we're going to spend a lot of time learning about latitude and mapping and mapping classrooms and campus and leading into uh, learning about coordinates and and gpsing and maybe doing some orienteering and just um, spending a lot of time with maps and this is for lower elementary lower elementary yes and then the um, second week the one that i'm more passionate about is the geocaching um, that will be that last June week, and again for lower elementary. And during that, we will um, go out and do geocaching. And in the midst of doing that, the plan is to also look at the botany in the areas that we're at and look at any zoology. So if we find animals or insects or and have a study of those going on, we're going to add some math in there with estimating how many steps it takes us, how long it takes us, how many geocaches could we find in a day, um, and then finding the geocaches. Geocaching, basically, somebody has hidden something out in the woods, and you they've put the coordinates down, and you have to try and go find it. Um, I was telling my class about it yesterday, and they're like, will we find gold? And I'm like, no, it's usually like the dollar store trinkets, but <laughs> the joy is in finding it, which sometimes they're a little bit challenging to find. Um, Kate and I will be doing that. And we will actually, Kate and I will probably go find the geocaches to make sure you can actually find them, because there's nothing more frustrating than not actually being able to find it or not be in the right spot. And, um, 
we will also do some care of environment too and bring some trash bags with us to pick up out on the trails because that's you know part of being out on the trails is enjoying the nature and, and you can't do that when there's trash <laughs> So I'm also offering two weeks. One is a February break and one is an April break. And I'm offering for grades six through nine. So we're actually hoping to pull in maybe a couple of alumni or reaching out to um, some of the slightly older uh, folks, kids in the community. Um, my first program is actually watching a few movies. Uh, we are gonna focus on the British Queen Victoria. And we're gonna analyze Truth, History, and Hollywood. And we're gonna watch these three movies. The Young Victoria, Mrs. Brown, and Victoria and Abdul. So all of these were big movie theater movies. They're not documentaries or anything. We're gonna watch these and we're gonna say, okay, let's look at these. Why were these topics chosen? Why were these actresses chosen? Let's put the movies aside. Let's look at some of the secondary sources. What have historians said? What historians were working on the movies? Let's put those aside. Let's look at the primary sources. What letters, what journals did Victoria leave us? Did her family? Let's put these all together and then go back to the movies and say, hey, true, not true. If a movie says based in truth, based in fact, do you believe it? Can you believe it? And kind of go from there. Is this like fake movies? <laughs> fake movies? <laughs> um, but I have, I have a real passion for women's history, for British history, and I kind of pull all of this together. And these are actually movies that I probably would have shown clips in class anyway, but we'll get to do the whole thing. The kids are always very irritated at me when I show them a clip and not the whole thing. So this is their chance. That's February. Um, so that'll be here on campus. Um, I think a, a very, if I may, I think a very <coughs> critical, important piece of this is, you know, we, we spend forever dealing with children and young people who are drowning in seas of information. And, you know, the, the well, I saw it, it's in Wikipedia, it must be right. Mm -hmm. uh, and helping them to gain the critical skills of how do you differentiate, how do you look behind, <laughs> you know, and say, wait a minute. <laughs> This isn't right, or how do I find the true? How do I find the truth? You know. So I think there's, there's a very valuable skill. People and figuring out what your sources are, can you trust them? When we do current events in middle school. One of my kids the other day told me their source for their news was Alexa. <laughs> I said, well, that might be an avenue, but Alexa got it from somewhere. I want to know where it's coming from. The reason fake news is a problem is because a lot of us don't know where it's actually coming from. I want you to know. I want you to be informed. So my April week is going to take us off campus a bit, and this is going to be um, an ex exploration of living history in Concord, Massachusetts, dealing with the transcendentalist writers and a little bit of the history there, Louisa May Alcott, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, they all lived there, they all kept copious journals, they were history makers just by the fact that they were living their lives in the way they were, which wasn't quite to the beat of the same drummer as everybody else. Of course, this is also a historic location regarding the American Revolution, so how did they react to living in a historical place? And we are going to go to these places, we are gonna hey. talk with docents there. I've also spent a number of years working at Orchard House, the Louisa May Alcott home, so I've got, you know, the ins and outs, and I know everybody there. I can take them, you know, beyond the regular tour. We're also going to head into Harvard to Houghton Library, which is where the archives are kept. I'm very passionate about using primary sources in our work, and I want them to look at the lock of hair that this person left as a gift for someone, or their actual handwriting. And understand, we wear gloves. We don't write up. This paper is old, it might fall apart. How do we take care of that? How do we protect our history? And at the end of this, after all this voyaging and studying here and why are they important, they're gonna put on a kind of living history piece and I've yet to decide who the audience will be, whether we'll try to get some other classes in here or the parents or whatnot, but they will become these people and our audience will be able to interview them. 
ask them about their lives. We're going to work on, you know, costume pieces. What was the world like? What do I think? Um, Louisa May Alcott had this habit of walking to Boston from Concord, about 18, 19 miles. Um, we can ask them how they felt about that. You know, we teased them about walking to Salem, and they were like, <laughs> so, you know, we're going to get some differences. That's going to be a lot more out and about, which is why it's in the spring. Visiting a lot of new places, doing some stuff here, but really putting themselves in someone else's shoes to learn about that history, to learn about the decisions that are made, and why just being kind of normal also makes history. And I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has. Again, it's grade six to eight. That's six to eight. Is we the fifth grade in there? It sounds so good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love it. Um, no. I <laughs> next, next time. Katie. So I'm Katie Overlander, and I'm the second drama teacher here at the school. I'm so very excited about the opportunity to spend two full weeks working on a production at the amazing Gloucester stage. Um, this being in that environment is going to give us the chance to not only be in a space that's worthy of our talents, but also to be able to take advantage of uh, the artisans that they have there that help um, to make professional theater. What a wonderful opportunity for our students. Um, so we will have um, access to some of the um, lighting technicians, um, set, costumes. We yeah. hope to bring in as many people as we can, professionals, to work with the kids. Uh, and then we're going to have a very strong team of teachers also who are going to help us to tackle all of these different areas that we're going to be pursuing because, as you know, theater needs a community. So we're very excited about um, meeting all of the kids, meeting their interests, maybe sparking new interests in different okay. areas. I've always found that kids, some kids might say, I'm just interested in the tech theater part. But then they're quietly watching while people are acting and, oh, maybe I'll have one line or how come I don't have more lines? You know, so we're going to make it a safe um, environment where kids will be able to pursue these different things and maybe find some things that they didn't think they were good at or they didn't think they were interested in in the world of theater. Um, my work will be largely informed by who signs up. So whenever I look uh, at, I'm going to be doing a production, I have to look at what, who, who are the children that are participating, and then what do they need. Then I have to either choose a piece of material that's already written that I think will fit those kids, or write one myself. So at this point, I'm not sure what the material will be, but I can guarantee you that it will be tailored to what those children will need, as will the technical aspects of the thing. People are interested in designing costumes, we'll design costumes, etc. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind is that we, uh, this is a show that is going to be for grades four through eight. So it's going to be a little bit of a different experience than the musical that we offered last year because we're going to have a little bit more of a sophisticated uh, environment and a more sophisticated material that the kids will be working with. So, you know, this will not be a musical, it will be what they call straight play, which means that it won't have singing, but it may have environmental music, perhaps music that we create ourselves. Um, we're not sure yet. We'll see who's there and what they need. Um, I'm really excited about it being a two-week period, because when we do a show, a lot of times I'm seeing them a couple of times a week for a long period of time. This will be something where the kids can truly become immersed in the excitement, in the uh, hard work, and, and ultimately, um, we will feel so proud about what we, what we um, deliver on this wonderful um, stage, Gloucester stage. And the Gloucester stage folks are very excited to have us come. Uh, and, uh, interestingly, I was talking with one of them the other night, the Act Actors' Equity mandates a three-week rehearsal period, uh, and we're only giving our kids two. So, <laughs> so if any of your kids are members of Equity, just keep it. <laughs> Yes, um, so I'll talk about my first um, experience week that will happen in February, um, the week of February 18th to 20, uh, the 22nd. It's called Form, Functions, Fractals, and Fibonacci, and it's all about making connections between geometry and art. Um, one of my passions is integrating arts throughout the curriculum. Um, it's uh, one of the things I've been trained in, and I 
love making those interdisciplinary connections and getting the kids to get creative. Um, and often, if they can get creative with science, math, or history, um, it creates a wonderful art where the child feels ownership over their learning. So when I began to examine um, what I could do uh, for the experience weeks, I thought it would work very well with Montessori because our Montessori math curriculum is very visual already. We have the proofs of the Pythagorean theorem and Euclid's shapes, um, and we have all of these things in our geometry cabinets, and they're very visual. So it's going to be natural for our Montessori students and for those that are in the public school that join us or from other independent schools that may join us, it will be great for their uh, visual thinking as well. And I think it will be a very fun um, week. Fun, but educational, as Paul said. <laughs> um, so we're going to, some questions we'll look at. We'll look at how do we look at art and what elements um, are in our visual vocabulary. We'll practice uh, BTS, which is Visual Thinking strat uh, Strategies. This is a research-based method um, from Harvard that encourages the students to observe independently and back up their comments with evidence. So it's one of the things that um, I did in graduate school, and I'm really excited to apply uh, during this experience week. So well, every day we'll have key lessons in geometry, and those key lessons will be determined by who enrolls in the program and the age level, because I, it will be open from fourth through eighth grade. So if I have more on the uh, older end of the spectrum, I'll do the fractals and Fibonacci and stuff like that. If I have more of the fourth and fifth graders, I can also make those key lessons very age appropriate. So I have those geometry lessons already um, in my lesson plans, and I'll also be working with uh, Victor Young, who's an amazing um, engineer, scientist, artist, renaissance man. So he also has a wealth of lessons up his sleeve. So depending on who we see in roles by November, we'll decide what key geometry lessons are we going to focus in on. Then, I've already spoken with Christine G, who is the um, head of the education department at the Addison Gallery of Art at Phillips Academy Andover. And depending on who you have enrolled and everything, we'll make those connections to the collection. So she's already been sending me some of the artists that are in the collection, and I'm making plans to go visit the museum this fall. Um, she may come out and meet the kids um, at the beginning of the week as well. And so she's going to be very involved. Um, and Christine G um, is an amazing educator. She's very uh, inquiry-based. She, I loved what she said to me on the phone, which is, um, I want the children to feel that they are the experts when they walk into the museum and that they have a voice. So um, it'll be really exciting. So part of the week is going into the museum. We'll have the key geometry lessons here and then um, I'm hoping for twice, we'll get to go to the museum. So a sample schedule might be Monday, we have orientation, and uh, we get to practice our visual thinking strategies, have our key geometry lesson, and then Tuesday, we go to the museum all morning. Uh, we leave first thing in the morning, we get into the collection, and we start to make those connections between the geometry and the art. And then <coughs> when we get back in the afternoon, we start to use those visual thinking strategies and create something. So in the afternoons, we'll be working with our hands, hands on. And then um, on Wednesday, we'll go back to a key geometry lesson and making more art. Um, Thursday, we'll visit the museum again. And Thursday afternoon, kind of finalize what we want to exhibit on Friday. So it will be really exciting. There's sort of a three part. So there's the observation in the museum. There's um, having the key geometry lessons here and working with ruler, compass, protractor, working with a geometry kit as a geometer. And there is the creative part of working with the clay or the paints. Um, so we'll have a lot of art supplies on hand and we'll be making something. So. 
Um, those are the three sort of skills we're going to do. Um, the students will also um, be able to make some literary connections. So we'll take excerpts from uh, Flatland by Edwin Abbott Abbott. And uh, it's a really interesting uh, book where uh, basically we take a look at the world from the perspective of different geometry figures, you know, from the perspective of the story. So we'll so also be looking at perspectives. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess that's, um, that's something I'm very excited about. I love museum and school partnerships, so um, this will be a great opportunity for us. Um, the second week that I'm working on um, is on habitats and biomimicry. Um, and it's a design and building for nature um, experience week. I did something similar at camp over this past summer. If some of you saw some of our offerings at camp, I did a designing and building naturally workshop. And our students built the little teepee out of the bamboo in the back um, garden. If you've seen it here to the left of the art shed, I worked with I the great opportunity to work with Beth Siminsky on that. And we had a great time hiking around, looking at um, animals and their shelters and their habitats and thinking, how can we build like a beaver does? Um, how can we build using only the materials beavers use? Sticks, mud, and rocks. Um, and so the kids loved at imagining that. So in, in the Habitat Week, this will take place in April. It's also grades four through eight. Um, and we will discuss, of course, what a habitat and what an ecosystem is. We'll review different habitats and we will visit um, local places like the Ipswich River or the Audubon um, Reservation. And then we will build uh, naturally from natural materials our own design. So the students will get a chance to be creative but also to engineer something. Um, and I'm really excited to work with Victor Young um, on that as well. Um, so what I love about uh, the building project is students will practice 21st century skills like collaboration, uh, cooperation, and it will also be like a STEM kind of uh, project. So incorporating uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and also a little bit of art in there, so steam. I love steam. So um, we're really excited about this week. So that will happen in uh, April. And um, we're excited to, to build that. Thanks. Uh, uh, another unfamiliar face to you, <laughs> Amanda Madera from uh, Maritime Gloucester. And I'll ask Amanda to speak in just a minute, but I wanted to uh, uh, one, one partner who isn't here today, Emily Flaherty from uh, Salem Sound Coast Watch, uh, because she's scuba diving in Belize. <laughs> Someone had to do it, right? <laughs> but uh, we have two very exciting offerings with, with, uh, with uh, Salem Sound Coast Watch, and I, I just wanted to uh, point, point them out to you. They're, in a way, sort of similar to what we're trying to do with Maritime Gloucester, uh, using an environment uh, that's outside of our school walls, uh, a, a real local environment and do something that, that, that uh, turns that into a, a very important teaching tool. Uh, the one, one that, uh, that uh, uh, Emily is working on with us, which I'm really excited about, is called A River Runs Through. Not quite A River Runs Through It, but A River Runs Through. But uh, taking a look at, uh, at our relationship to, uh, to, a, to a geographic place. To, you know, if, you, if you've ever been out in Beverly and Salem harbors and look at the rivers that form, that form those harbors that, and, 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 and think, about, think about the relationship of mankind to, to those river places. And, if you can, and, and we will really be looking longitudinally at, okay, so settler arrives has a little saltwater farm, uh, does a little fishing, has some fish stages, uh, the next thing is a little boat yard, and you know, then someone figures out how you, how you can put a dam across the creek, and then you have a mill, uh, and then the mill gets bigger, and then the mills get even bigger, and then you have whole cities and towns built around those mills on the rivers, and now Peabody Square floods. <laughs> and what's the connection between all of that? 
okay. And so, uh, so really sort of thinking about, uh, having the kids think about it and, and dig into our relationship to, to our environment. And the other one, which sounds very simple, but is actually incredibly complex, is eelgrass as bioengineers. Uh, eelgrass is a very underrated uh, sort, of, <laughs> sort of plant, but it is, uh, it is absolutely critical uh, to our coastal environment. And, uh, and, uh, and the, the, the carbon, the, the, the carbon storing and you know, the, the, what, what happens, to the, the chemical, chemical process that, uh, that eelgrass facilitates. And so, uh, you know, and, and again, as we change our environment, as we pave over waterfronts, as we endanger salt marshes, as sea level rises, uh, you know, there are implications for, for all of that. And I think for kids to understand uh, what that is and what the science is and what the, what the importance of environment is, uh, maybe helps them think about how they'd be better stewards or make responsible decisions as they, as they, as they grow. So, uh, Emily asked me to make that plug. <laughs> Those plugs, and there they are. Yeah. What were the ages for that? Okay, so the ages, yeah, uh, the ages are in the catalog, but the ages for eelgrass, uh, river runs through as grades six through nine, and eelgrass is six through nine as well. Yeah. Uh, so, Amanda, we have two courses that uh, Maritime Gloucester uh, is working. One is for younger kids in February inside in the in the wet lab and the pocket aquarium and the other is later on in the summer. So. On the waterfront. Yeah. And I've worked with Emily at a lot of the organizations that work on the waterfront and uh, marine science and beyond that um, we sort of partner together so there's a lot of overlap and sharing of equipment and go to the same um, conferences and whatever. And she's great. She's really lovely. Um, so we are going to be offering the two courses. Um, the one, the older one at the end of June, is we're diving into trying to get a sensibility of students or people's relationship to the environment and their responsibility for it and sort of the very, very large picture. So we're gonna dive into the cod fishing industry and the story of the cod. Maritime Gloucester has a lot of great waterfront facilities. It's right on the water, connected to all of the community in Gloucester. We have ways, to, we have outdoor aquariums, indoor aquariums have microscope labs. We have connection to boats to get out onto the water. Um, and we share, we partner with a lot of the Cape Ann Museum and uh, marine industries there. So we can go visit lobster pounds. We can go sort of, our partners are within the community. So this course is going to sort of dive into looking at the biology of the fish, the ecology of the codfish, why it became the state symbol, why it became such an economic driver in, in um, Massachusetts, what the fishermen's lives are like, how it is, how to construct cods, how do you catch a cod. Just so exploring sort of a big picture, weaving in technology and biology and ecology and economics to weave into this tapestry to see, to sort of reflect back on the students, what's their own personal relationship to the ocean and the ocean environment and their sort of, and the marine community or straight coastal community, and sort of compare that having some frame of reference with the story of the cod fishery in Gloucester. Um, so there'll be a, some kind of product at the end of it, not sure exactly sort of either a timeline, some it'll again depend on what students are in there and where that direction goes for the creative product of it. Um, and the course in February for the younger students is, is more focusing on uh, observation and interpretation through art and science. So again, there's a lot of overlap, it sounds like, with a lot of the courses as well. Um, so again, we have access to live animals and facilities there and little mini ecosystems with our indoor aquariums. Um, and space and art supplies and artifacts to take off from, from that. Um, yeah, so that's... And, and, and one of your partners from here will be our art teacher. Fabulous. So, yeah. We've worked with Victor. We've had a great, we did some just relationship with partners with Arbor Light in the past. And wonderful. Yeah, for those of you so, who don't know, we are, our, our, you know, middle schools do a class trip and they often go to places like Washington or New York or in well, Three years, ago, three years ago, our middle school went to Gloucester. Yeah. <laughs> they, they rented a house, they, they went online, they found they rented a house in Wingershie, 
for the week. Uh, we worked with Maritime Gloucester. They, kids who had grown up on Cape Ann saw Gloucester in a way they had never seen Gloucester before. Uh, and the ultimate moment was that as they were going through the week, they were, they were collecting stuff. They were, you know, like a lobster trap that had washed ashore on the, on the, on the break sort of the marine or, debris or whatever. And, and their final morning, they built this giant sculpture down where, where Wingasheek Beach and Coppins Beach meet, the rocks there, and they built this giant sculpture, I mean, like three stories, this thing was amazing, and taking pictures, and they're going to leave, leave it there. And someone says, wait a minute, if we leave it there, it becomes litter. And they came away with this mega lesson, which was the ultimate invasive species, was guess who? <laughs> So it was really cool. <laughs> so if, if nobody's, if you're not familiar with Maritime Gloucester, you can go do the online, just look it up at maritimegloucester.org. But there's, it's, it's basically the um, very hands-on exploration of what we do. And we've tied into, we can go sort of anywhere from the mass standard STEM, STEM um, way to, to a lot of things. And so we've got plenty of staff there to have some fun with that. And I think many of the people in this room have been to Maritime Gloucester for uh, Art on the Pier. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. And last but not least. Victoria. Hello, I'm Victoria. I'm from OutdoorClassrooms.com, and I have been invited to come to a couple experience weeks with your kids. I first want to ask you all, how many of you have had a vegetable garden? As, as, how about as kids? Did you have vegetable gardens as children? So what those memories? What were those memories like for you? Good? Celery right out of the garden. Celery right out of the garden feels good. Water, right. Water. right. So that is basically what we're going to be doing. We're going to be basing um, our, the experience weeks completely on our children's book. And the children's book is From Peas to Table. And this children's book was inspired by our own Thomas Jefferson. So there's a connection. We're going to have older kids and younger kids. The younger, older kids can also. Uh, but this book is wonderful because it basically has, um, it talks about Thomas Jefferson's uh, passion for gardening. And um, he did um, a contest every year from Peace to Tables with his community. And, what he, and this wonderful author who I have interviewed, um, Susan Grigsby, which we'll share the interview as well, um, she put this whole, basically in a very childlike way, has uh, um, explained what that um, ex uh, competition is like in terms of growing, growing peas. So we're going to be doing that in our experience weeks throughout. We'll be looking at peas, we'll do, be doing seed experience, experiments <coughs> on all the different peas. We will be transforming the um, outdoor space near the um, greenhouse into our own sort of lab, so to speak, our Monticello. Um, so that will be, they'll be building, they'll be having, comp not competitions, but they'll become engineers and kind of creating what they need for the peas to grow up. So we'll be doing, we'll be in the art lab, we'll be doing, uh, they'll be making a sign, so it can be making it an outdoor experience. Um, but it, the whole basis is based on this book. And we're really looking at um, Thomas Jefferson. So this is a multi-age um, experience. We will we'll be partner, partnering younger children with older children. Um, they'll also be making um, uh, their own scientific journals, keeping journals. And so this is an incredible, I mean, incredible journal of his um, of the whole gardens of Monticello. So lots of lots of um, fun experiences. Yeah, and I would, have any of you ever kept a gardener's journal? My, my mother did, and it, it was the most amazing sort of, I mean, detailed about, you know, which wheat you plant what, and which variety you did whatever, and which, yeah. you know, and, and which bugs you had, you know, and I mean, it, you know, and so if you're thinking about how, you know, it, you know a takeaway, yeah. the art of, you know, of, of observation and learning from, and I've also asked Victoria to talk a little bit about the work she's doing with the faculty because it's this experience yeah. we're offering is really part of that bigger picture of how we really truly use our outdoor environment. So I am so excited. Uh, this is an incredible campus, 
And so what we've done is we met as a, as a, um, a whole school uh, at the end of last year, I think it was. Yeah. And teachers got very excited about their own different spaces and started creating their vision for those spaces. And so I'm working with them all this year um, to really um, enhance what they can add. Outdoor learning stations, mud kitchens, um, literacy gardens, math gardens, anything that is sort of up there what they envision. The whole concept is that, they, that there's a real um, thread between their indoor curriculum and their outdoor space. Um, so there's an even flow, flow to that. So the experience week will really sort of kick off. It will be very visual. There will be signs. It will look like a space um, that looks like an outdoor classroom. So the hope is that that will feed into not only that space, but that will sort of get all the teachers charged up and they are excited. Um, and that, that will sort of have this domino effect into all of their individual outdoor spaces. So they're going to be coming to you for donations and whatnot. And so labor. Labor and, <laughs> and excitement and hopefully your kids will come home and say, oh my goodness, I did this today. And so it's, it's really to inspire the kids. The kids will inspire us and, and the, the rest of the community. So I'm thrilled because the space is... There's so many possibilities. And again, it's not going to take a lot of money. It's just a lot of excitement and energy. And hopefully that, that then the kids will have that those experiences that you have in your own garden um, here at school. So that's, that's great. <laughs> well, I mean, we do. We have this wonderful space. And, and, and typically what happens is somebody gets, oh, there's a greenhouse. I'll go out and do something with the greenhouse. Well, but I can't do it today because I've got whatever. Or, gee, I'd love to have a koi pond behind my classroom or, you know, whatever. And, and so. Let's do it right <laughs> and, and, yeah. and get the whole faculty owning it. And my dream, the thing I would love someday out of it, there's a uh, Huntington Gardens out at the Huntington uh, in, in, in Pasadena, California. Any of you have been there? Uh, all these amazing gardens. And my favorite little garden at the Huntington is the Shakespeare Garden. Mm. And it's a garden uh, of plants and herbs, <coughs> all of which are play a role somewhere in Shakespeare's writings. So there's hemlock? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, that, somewhere, you know, you know, either in the sonnets or in, or in the plays, or in, there, there's, you know, uh, I think hemlock was uh, ancient Greek. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, and I would love, I mean, to me, the ultimate connection between sort of getting your hands in the soil and literature would be a little Shakespeare. So just plant that seed. <laughs> so uh, I hope this has been a good taste of what Experience Weeks are, are about. Uh, there's, there's some more in the catalog. Uh, the catalog is a living thing. Uh, I've actually had a couple of people come and say, ooh, what, you know, could I do something in the whatever week for lower elementary? And so stay tuned for some updates. Uh, but, uh, you know, and this is our first year of this, and we hope to learn a lot. Uh, we will be certainly looking for feedback, both from students and parents, at the, uh, as, as the year progresses. But I'm, I think we're all just very, very excited that this is really taking Montessori to a different, different level. Uh, and, and, and beginning to use our community resources you know, in, in, in a systematic way. So, uh, we'll be able to sign up soon? Yes, within, within days. Within, <laughs> yes. Uh, so thank you all very much for, uh, for coming and spread the word. <laughs>